Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Harford. I'm a BBC presenter, Financial Times columnist, professional nerd, and uh, author of a brand new book called How to Make the World Add Up. It's obligatory that I wave this book around. Um, the How to Make the World Add Up is a book about thinking clearly about the world by thinking clearly about the numbers and thinking clearly about yourself. Um, but I'm actually not here to talk about how to make the world add up. Instead, I want to pull a story out of that book. And I want to tell, I want to tell you the story. And the story is, is a tale of fusty old Victorians. Some of them have uh, bonnets and all of them have tight-fitting clothes with far too much starch. And you, you might wonder for a moment why I would tell you such a story. But it, it's also a tale of hospitals being overwhelmed, of a deadly infectious disease, of a national catastrophe, bungling, arguments about whether anything could be done or not, and graphs, lots and lots and lots of graphs. And so I think I don't need to explain why this old story might have a lesson or two for us to learn today. And the story really begins in uh, the hospital at uh, Scutari Barracks in Istanbul. This is on the, the east side, the Asian side of the Bosphorus. And Scutari Barracks, when constructed in the early 1800s, they were the largest barracks anywhere in the world. But by the mid 1850s, they were to become the largest hospital anywhere in the world. They had been converted to be an emergency military hospital uh, receiving casualties from the British Army, which was fighting elsewhere on the Black Sea over in Crimea in a, in a particularly uh, pointless war uh, amid a century of pointless wars. And our hero, a young woman, called Florence Nightingale, first saw Scutari Barracks from the ship as she sailed up the Bosphorus. And she commented that to innocent eyes, the Scutari Barracks seemed magnificent there. Their white marble, their towers. But she later reflected, to our eyes, they were whited sepulchres, pest houses. Because when Nightingale arrived to take charge of the nursing at the hospitals, several hospitals in Scutari, what she encountered was a humanitarian catastrophe. She wrote uh, a note to a friend, uh, a doctor back in England. Uh, oh, you gentlemen of England can have little idea from reading the newspapers of the horror and misery in a military hospital of operating upon these dying and exhausted men, that this is the kingdom of hell, no one can doubt. The British army was ill-equipped to be fighting in Crimea, and the hospital was particularly ill-suited. Um, Nightingale begged the, um, the quartermasters of, of the British army to supply her with the equipment that she needed, but they seemed to delight in not giving her, possibly you know, a woman in a man's world, not giving her what she wanted. So again, she wrote back home to complain of the situation. No mops, no plates, no wooden trays, no slippers, no shoe brushes, no blacking, no knives and forks, no spoons, no scissors for cutting the men's hair, which is literally alive, no basins, no toweling, no chloride of lime. This wasn't just a, a complaint that she didn't have the equipment she needed to do her job. Um, it was part of a campaign. Uh, Florence Nightingale was uh, uh, remarkably effective at using the press to gain what she wanted, to arouse uh, public interest, public sympathy, public anger about what was happening in the hospitals in Scutari. And what was happening was appalling. So men would be brought into the hospital, uh, they would lie there shivering cold, uh, they would die of their wounds or of diseases, they would be stitched up in their own blankets and then carried out to be dumped in a mass grave, leaving space for the next man to take their place. Uh, the British army was shredded over the winter of 1855 
by infectious diseases, uh, many of which were in those hospitals. 10% of the entire strength of the British Army died. 10% of the men in the British Army died in that one month alone, January 1855. And throughout all of this, Nightingale was trying to figure out what was happening, how to deal with it, how to raise the money, get the supplies that she needed, and above all, how to prevent these men from dying. By the spring, April, May, things had become significantly better. The death toll had dramatically fallen. The hospitals were in better order. Um, and Nightingale, in fact, felt able to travel over to the Crimean Peninsula itself. And by this time, she was pretty much the only figure in the entire waging of the Crimean War whose reputation was still intact. The politicians were in disgrace, the generals were in disgrace. Florence Nightingale was well on her way to becoming a saint. And as she observed the troops around the siege of Sebastopol, they gave her three cheers. She was very moved by the spectacle. But then shortly afterwards, returning to the camp at Balaclava in Crimea, on the 13th of May, Florence Nightingale suddenly collapsed. And very soon, the rumours started to spread around the camp that Florence Nightingale was dying. Now, when I think about how we view Florence Nightingale today, uh, it's extraordinary. She's a sort of John Lennon of nursing, you know, marked by this the tragic early passing that ripped her away from us, uh, celebrated, put on the, the covers of magazines. The big issue put Florence Nightingale on the cover of, the magazine, uh, of their magazine very early on in the pandemic, All Hail Nightingale, the hand-washing queen. We named our emergency hospitals after her. We put her on the banknotes. She was the only woman other than the queen on English banknotes in the 20th century. Uh, my own mother, when she died in 1996, she took her last breath in a Florence Nightingale hospice. She's absolutely everywhere. The curious thing about this is that she really isn't the John Lennon of nursing. She didn't die that day at Balaclava. She recovered, at least partially. And instead of passing away at the age of 35, she went on to live to the age of 90. And it's really what she did in those decades and decades of life that were given to her when people thought she was dying. What she did then, that is what really fascinates me. And that's what I want to talk about. Now, you see, this is really a story about an argument over public health and the weapons that were used to fight in that argument and what those weapons can teach us about today. What Florence Nightingale did almost immediately on returning from Crimea was to speak to the Queen, Queen Victoria. I mean, Nightingale was the most famous woman in the British, arm, uh, British Empire other than Victoria herself. And she persuaded Victoria to um, set up a royal commission um, to investigate what it was that had happened in those Crimean hospitals and what lessons more generally could be learned. Um, there was a, a particular uh, event that had made a huge impression on Nightingale. In March of 1855, just after this utterly catastrophic winter, a commission had come um, from the UK with the doctor, John Sutherland and others at the request of Nightingale. And they'd inspected the hospitals and tried to figure out um, how to improve conditions there. And um, they'd done some pretty basic things. For example, they discovered that there was a, a dead horse in the main water supply to one of the hospitals. They discovered that the latrines were, um, were leaking into the water supply. So effectively, uh, cholera from these soldiers was just draining from the sewage directly back into the drinking water. And they'd done other things like uh, whitewash the walls with uh, antiseptic um, uh, lime paint. 
uh, they'd clear away the, the dead dogs. And Nightingale was all for this. Um, she commented in another of her letters, the sanitary commission is really doing something and has set to work burying dead dogs and whitewashing walls, two prolific causes of fever. Now, <clears throat> after the sanitary commission had done its work, could the conditions in the hospitals were vastly more pleasant, but also the death rate was vastly lower. And Nightingale observed this and she thought there was no coincidence. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.